Blog Talk Radio. Hi, this is David Worth. I was the director of photography on Bloodsport and the director of Kickboxer, launching the career of John Claude Van Damme. You're listening to Justin Ray Harvey. Hi, this is Tony Luke Jr., a.k.a. Joey the Nail Nardone, and you're listening to Justin Ray Harvey. This is Stan Bush. I sing Fight to Survive in the movie Bloodsport. You're listening to Justin Ray Harvey. Hi, I'm Tony Luke Jr., also known as Joey the Nail. Please follow my friend, Justin Ray Harvey, on Facebook, Twitter, and Skype. His tag is at Justin Harvey. He's a great guy. I follow him, and I know you'll enjoy following him, too. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. We are live on J. Ray Radio. I am your host, Justin Ray Harvey. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I was having trouble dialing in to Blog Talk Radio for some reason. But without further ado, let's see if I can't get my guest on the line, um, Mr. David Worth. He worked on the movie Board Sport, and he was also the director of a, another great film called Kickboxer. So let me see if I can get him on the line. I can hear you, Justin. David, how's it going, my friend? I'm here, dude. I'm here waiting. Oh, awesome. How are you feeling tonight? Excellent. Awesome. So, um, welcome to the show, and I appreciate you coming on to the show with your busy schedule and a, and a short notice. And I know that me and you have been corresponding this interview for quite a few weeks now, so... So well, it's, it's my pleasure, it's really Justin. It, uh, I enjoyed hearing all of the, the voices and music and sounds from Bloodsport. It brought back a lot of good memories. Awesome, awesome. So uh, to start things off, David, if you don't mind, um, could you tell my audience how you got involved with Bloodsport and also Kickboxer? Uh, certainly. Uh, I was actually uh, doing a very big second unit at Warner Brothers on a film called Inner Space. It starred Martin Short. It was a big special effects movie, and I was DPing the second unit on it uh, in Hollywood and also up in San Francisco. Uh, when I got an interview um, to go to Canon Pictures and interview for a little martial arts film uh, called Bloodsport, and I went and met the producer. And I met the director, um, uh, and uh, we talked and chatted, and uh, it was launching some new guy that I didn't know about called Jean-Claude Van Damme. And uh, a a few weeks uh, after I had met the director, Newt Arnold, Newt had been an assistant director uh, for Sam Peckinpah and William Friedkin. So he had really impeccable credentials, and uh, I really, that was the reason I wanted to do the movie, was just to work with me, because he had worked with a couple of my big heroes, Peckinpah, who did The Wild Bunch, and, and Straw Dogs, and uh, Bill Friedkin, who had done The French Connection, and uh, lots of great films. So I really wanted to work with me. He was directing, and... Uh, a few weeks later, I got the word that uh, we were, uh, that I'd gotten the job, and I was going to go, be going to Hong Kong, which I had never done before. I hadn't been to Hong Kong. And I actually had to uh, leave uh, inner space uh, a couple of weeks early. Most of the second unit had been done, and I went to the director, Joe Dante, and told him my situation. And he said, fine, we don't want to keep you from uh, having this opportunity to go to DP a feature in Hong Kong, all the best. And he gave me a very nice send-off in front of the the casting crew, and and I was off to Hong Kong. Wow. 
Yeah, I I actually I actually wanted to tell you something too. Now that I think about it, when I first when I first met my instructor and one of my best friends in the world, Frank Dukes, when I interviewed him, the way he described you, he said that you were a brilliant mind to work with. Oh, that's very that's very kind of Frank. Frank was great. You know, I mean, the the movie, of course, was based on. Uh, on Frank, we took a lot of flights of fancy, uh, but it was based on Frank. Frank was the original MMA underground fighter back in the day when those fights were illegal uh, and, mm-hmm. and done in, you know, done done off the grid and off the charts. And uh, and he was he, so he was a tough, he was a very tough bad dude to go and do that back in the day because there was no. There were no rules, uh, there was no sanctions, there was no having it on television so people could see it and make it popular. He was a tough guy, and we enjoyed having him on the film. He was there as our, uh, uh, basically as our, uh, as our authority to go to, uh, to, to make sure that we, that we got it right, even though we weren't, you know, we weren't trying to make a documentary on his life, it was a fantasy Based on his life, but it was a it was a Hollywood feature with um, with action and adventure and uh, and all of those good things. But Frank was a, a joy to work with. And if it wasn't for Frank, there wouldn't be a blood sport. Oh, I, I, absolutely, and that that has been my favorite film since I was three years old. So, I mean that that film and Frank's life has made a huge impact on me and that's why it's such a huge honor to you know have you on my show tonight and um also one of my other uh favorite films was uh kickboxer how did that come about and did did the direction go that uh go the way that you wanted it to go or very very much so um one other comment on, on, on Bloodsport, there isn't a week go by, goes by that someone doesn't tell me when they find out that I was the DP on Bloodsport, or they say that was my favorite film. I just finished teaching a couple of weeks of uh, summer film camp at UCLA, and one of the mentors there came and, and he knew my work, and he said, did I ever tell you that Bloodsport was my favorite film when I was growing up? So it, it's it, it, it's a favorite uh, with, with many people everywhere I go in the world, when they find out I do did blood sport and kickboxer, I, I hear that from young people that they, they grew up with it, they saw it with their dad, it made them, it helped them go into filmmaking or martial arts or whatever. Uh, kickboxer came about because um, the producer uh, was the same producer who did blood sport, and he saw how well I got along with the Hong Kong crew when we did Blood Sport and how I moved it along and, uh, uh, and and got everything done efficiently. And I kept asking him, I kept saying, you know, I want to direct the next one. I didn't even know there was going to be a next one. No, You never know. You, We didn't know if the film was going to be a hit or a miss. Well, uh, luckily, Mr. Van Damme, who I always like to say is the man who brought the art to martial arts, since he, since he comes from a dancing background, he made it very artistic and poetic, as well as as well as vicious and tough, and because of his good looks and his charm and his French accent, he also brought some another element to martial arts that had never been there before in the audience. He brought ladies. Mm-hmm. He brought the ladies to the audience. So uh, wow. kickboxer happened because Bloodsport was a hit, and um, actually there was a period of time when. We didn't know if we were going to get uh, Mr. Van Dam back. He was off doing a couple of other things. He didn't know if he wanted to come back and do another one. And we actually did some casting and uh, and had another person in in line to uh, for that role. But when when John Claude came back, we were more than thrilled to have John Claude back because we all thought that he he was really the reason why the film uh, why the film was a hit. Um, and uh, so I, I worked very, very carefully. The, the film wasn't didn't come together very easily. The financing was there, and then it was gone, uh, and then it came back again. And all, all during that time, I was I was polishing the script. I was doing my storyboards. I was working on um, on the ad campaign and the poster. And 
six or seven months went by that I worked on the film without really having the contract, without having uh, without without being paid for it. I just I rolled up my sleeves to show the producer how how much I really wanted to do the project, and then eventually it all came together and. Uh, there was a, a big a big two page ad, a centerpiece ad in the middle of Variety saying that um King's Road was announcing that Bloodsport would be shot in Hong Kong, uh starring Jean Claude Van Damme and directed by David Worth. And we were off to Hong Kong for my second time in two years. Bloodsport was nineteen eighty six and Kickboxer was nineteen eighty eight. Incidentally, there was just an a very, very famous anniversary that just happened to me a couple of days ago. I looked at my watch and I saw that I saw that it was August eighth. That is eight eight. And twenty five twenty four years ago, when we were in Hong Kong doing kickboxer, the final script, the date that the final script had on it was eight eight eighty eight. Which is a very lucky number. Eight is a very lucky number for Chinese. And so everyone said, oh, this is going to be a very lucky production. And it was because it, it was even bigger than Bloodsport. It went off and made Mr. Van Damme a big international star. And he was off and running, uh, you know, uh, on, a, on, a, uh, on what became a very, very long career. And uh, like everyone else uh, in, in our business, show business is full of, of hills and valleys, peaks and valleys. You have ups and downs. We all have, and Mr. Van Damme has. But he, you could, I was so thrilled to see him back in a big movie with Stallone as the bad guy in Expendables last year. Yeah, that that was a that was a great film. I actually went to see that on my birthday, and that was just it was an awesome film to see to see all those you know all those stars work together and work yes, together so it was wonderful. It was wonderful, yeah. So now that we've talked about uh, kickboxer and, and blood sport, um, 25 years later, because here recently uh, blood sport had the 25th anniversary. What are you doing now, David? Well, I, I, you know, I, people keep call, people. I, I've been teaching for the last uh, for the last seven years. Uh, I, um, I I started teaching at the college level, teaching filmmaking to undergraduate and graduates. Uh, I started at Chapman University in Orange County. I also taught at USC for a semester. I taught at UCLA. I even went to Singapore and taught for a year at Chapman's new facility there and lectured at the NYU Tisch Asia campus. And presently, I'm on the part-time faculty at UCLA, uh, where I teach summer school, and at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco, where I teach uh, cinematography and directing. So I have several film projects in, in various stages of production, but when you get to a certain age in, in, in the film business, uh, the phone stops ringing, and the phone stopped ringing exactly at the time that I put my foot into academia and started teaching. So I've I've had a great time uh, uh, passing the knowledge that I learned in filmmaking for 35 years uh, on to the the young filmmakers of the next generation. Wow! And um, like, have you heard? There's actually a rumor on the internet that um, there's going to be a remake of uh, Kickboxer in 2014. Yeah, no, actually, they're remaking. I see. I, I've heard that they're remaking both films, both the Bloodsport and Kickboxer. People have emailed me and uh, sent me, you know, information. Did you know about this? Did you know about that? And they're not remaking them in the sense of, of the same, the same story. And, and I don't think they're doing. If they do remake Bloodsport, I don't think they're doing it as a Frank Duke story or. Uh, kickboxer in the same way. I think that they're reimagining those films, and and mm-hmm. and and making them making them more high tech and high action and and CGI effect to compete with today's marketplace. I think they're just taking the titles and doing a whole going in a whole different direction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know for sure. No one's shown me a script, but I'm just I'm theorizing that they're that they're not remaking them. Uh, uh, in in the same way we we made the originals. Mhm. And also, I wanted to comment on on Kickboxer. I was I was looking at um 
I was looking on YouTube and discovered that in in some countries there's a uh, deleted scene uh, where uh, Van Damme visits his brother in the hospital, and it didn't make the U.S. version. And I wondered if you knew if you knew about that and why that scene never made Kickboxer for the U.S. version. Yeah, I, I think the problem. I, yeah, I, I remember shooting the scene. I know the scene very well, and um, it was an emotional scene. I have a feeling for the U.S. version, the film was a little long, and so they cut it to uh, be under 90 or 100 minutes, whatever the requirements for the distributor were. And for for other parts of the world, they felt they could make it a little longer, and the scene got put back in. Yeah, that that, that makes sense. I was. I was just curious about that because that that is a wonderful scene and it's it's very emotional. So right. So well, John Claude, uh, you know, John John Claude is a fine is a fine actor even in uh, uh, in in Bloodsport. Uh, you know he showed he showed his acting chops, uh, and he would always say, "Remember, uh, uh, I'm an actor first and then a martial artist." So he was he was more interested in, in portraying the emotion as much as he was interested in showing off his splits and his jumps and his leaps and his kicks. Mhm. Wow. Now, did did you shoot anything for Bloodsport that you wanted to be in the film, but it ended up not being in the film? No, no. Bloodsport, um, in fact, well, Newt Arnold directed Bloodsport, so I was the director of photography, and we shot we shot a lot. Newt shot mm-hmm. a lot of film on that. He shot like 240,000 feet of film, and all those fight scenes were covered um, uh, very, very heavily. We, we had three Panavision cameras, and we would shoot each fight scene with three, three cameras wide, then we would move the cameras in, tighten up the lenses and move the cameras in. One camera was always on a dolly. We'd shoot the fight again tighter. Then we would get on the mat and do handheld of the fight. And then we'd shoot the highlights of the fight, a certain punch or a kick or the last kick or the knockout in slow motion at 48 frames or 96 frames a second. So we really covered, uh, we, we, we shot a lot of footage and to my taste, we shot uh, a little too much footage. And as a result, when I came back and directed Kickboxer, I was able to, um, instead of shooting 240,000 feet of film, I shot about 120,000 feet of film. Uh, and we shot, for 42, we shot for 42 days on Bloodsport. On Kickboxer, we shot for like 35 or 36 days even though we shot in two countries on Kickbox. We shot in Hong Kong and Bangkok, and we made several trips back and forth. Um, but in Kickbox, it was all shot in Hong Kong. So I thought I was able to to, what I, to do was to streamline the production uh, and make it, a, make it a more efficient production, and, uh, and, uh, and I think I was able to, to pull that off. Well, in my mind, David, you did a brilliant job with um, both films. Both films. Thank you, Justin. Because, you know, everybody that's been a martial artist, I know that they've seen Bloodsport or Kickboxer or even both. I mean, you know, they're they're cold hard classics. So. Yes, and I know that not a. Not a week goes by that they're not. I don't. I don't go tuning through cable and see one of them on a cable channel. They used to run. They used to run Bloodsport every week on on G4. I would go tune by and there it would be. And uh, I know they're they're extremely popular. A lot of kids like, like yourself and others grew up with them. Uh, and uh, they were classics. You know, they they as I like to say, they launched John Claude's career. He went on to do a lot other a lot more. Films, a lot bigger films, but those two, Bloodsport and Kickboxer, were very special. They were small films. Both of those films together didn't cost five million dollars. Bloodsport wow. was two point two two point two million. Kickboxer was like two point three or two point four or five million. So both of those films combined 
were made for under $5 million, and yet they did astounding grosses worldwide and uh, launched Mr. Van Damme into the stratosphere. So they were small films. In fact, when I sometime between the time I was I had, when I was directing Kickboxer, I was at Canon Pictures, and uh, they were they were the distributors of Bloodsport. And I was walking around, and I happened to find a folder that showed all of their profits and losses. And they had all these big thirty-five million dollar films, Journey to the Center of the Earth, and uh, and this big film and that big film, all thirty-five, forty million dollar films. None of them made a profit. All the way down at the bottom of the page, the only film that was showing a profit was the little two point two million dollar blood sport. I thought that was pretty good. Uh, that that is um that is fantastic. And um a, a lot of people don't know this, but there's actually there's a, on the on the music side of things, there's two soundtracks to Blood Sport. One uh one was only available uh to purchase from Germany, and then the other was released U.S. in 2007, and then there's two different soundtracks for Kickboxer, so two different releases. I didn't know. I, I, I did not know that. I only I'm only familiar with the original Hollywood release of both films, the music and the soundtrack from both films. I'm not. I wasn't aware of a German release or any other release or any different release. Did they change the music? Uh, I, I I think so. I can. What I can do, David, when we get done with the show, I can um I can send you links and information ab- about it because see, like Fine. I said, I'm a big fan of Bloodsport and and that's pretty much what I do. I mean, I've got Bloodsport pretty much everything. So that's cool. Uh, so. It's 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 a good little movie and uh, and it it certainly was a stepping stone in my career and Mr. Van Damme's career. And you you know that there's one great actor who was in that film who just had a very small bit part in that who went on to win an Academy Award. Who's that? Um, wasn't that uh, Forrest Whitaker? Forrest Whitaker. Yes, mm-hmm. Forrest Whitaker yeah. is a great, great, great African-American actor. He's won the Academy Award, does his own films. And if you listen carefully, you can hear his voice on the NFL channel. He's the voice of football. He's just a wonderful actor. We were we were very privileged to have him in a small part in that film. And he went on to do Color of Money and lots of other huge films where he stole scenes from Paul Newman and uh, just an astounding actor. So that was thrilling. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I wanted to ask you, how did you guys... Like, you know the video game scene where Frank Dukes is playing Ray Jackson and they first meet? Right. How did you shoot the right. uh, video game scene? Do you have a phone ringing? Is that you? Uh, Yeah, but um, but I'm, I'm in the middle it. of this. So. Yeah. yeah okay. But, uh, uh, no, we, we actually, I think we had to shoot, we shot the scenes with Don Gibb and John claude separately from the video game, and we had to do the video game as an insert because mm-hmm. the video games were very very primitive back in those days, and we had to have somebody operating the video game to make it do what we wanted it to do, and we were filming that uh, with our 35-millimeter cameras, and we cut everything together in the editing. Ah, uh, I, I see. The guys were really playing that game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, after se- after seeing that scene, I had to I had to get that game. <laughs> I was like, I have to get that now. You know. So cool. I mean, that, cool. that's that's a classic scene. And speaking speaking of For- Forrest Whitaker, what was funny about the film is like he didn't have very many lines, and when he did speak, he he got interrupted all the time. Yeah, that was the joke between the other actor and Forrest. They, their parts were very, their, their parts were smaller, and they were like they were, but they were, you know, they were instrumental in telling the story of the film. So in order to make those parts interesting, they came up with the idea of every time Forrest would try to say something, he would say he would say too much, and the other guy would interrupt him. So they 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 actually brought more uh, reality and more interest to the characters. 
by their improvising and 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 adding the the character of Forrest trying to speak and, and, and always being interrupted by his older partner. Yeah, I always I always thought that that was amusing. <laughs> yes, and that's that's the reason why they did it because they realized they were small parts and they wanted to make them they wanted to bring another dimension to them and they and they did a fine job. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I'd like to comment, David, if they did make a remake of Bloodsport, which I know they're talking about doing it, um, I would love to see you work on the film. Well, I would love to work on any film. Uh, I'm the kind of guy that I do any film that comes across my desk. Uh, one of my heroes in the film business, two of my heroes in the film business, were D.W. Griffith and John Ford. And when I started looking into into their lives, I realized that back in the early 1900s, D.W. Griffith invented the language of movies while he was working at a studio called Biograph because over a five-year period, he made not 100, not 200, not 300, not 400. He made over 450 one- and two-reel movies while he and his cinematographer, Billy Bitzer, invented the language of filmmaking that we use today. And, wow. uh, and John, John Ford did the same thing. Uh, you know, 20 years later, he made like 30 or 40 10-day westerns be ever, before he ever did one of his serious feature films. Uh, so I always, those guys, those guys were my heroes, and I knew I would never get a chance to do 60 uh, or, or 100 or 200 or plus movies in my life. So I just took anything I could get my hand, any any film that came across my desk, I didn't care if it was action, if it was horror, if it was a, a love story, if it was a TV series, if it was a first unit, if it was a second unit, if it was martial arts, if it was a thriller. I didn't care. I just wanted to get the work because I wanted to get my chops. I wanted to mm-hmm. learn as much about the filmmaking as I could, and the only way to learn is to do it. Just like playing oh. playing an instrument, the only way you get your oh, chops is by playing it's an like, instrument. It's like you wanted to do anything that you could, you know. I mean, any type of film. I mean, Absolutely. that shows your passion for you know for filming. Is you don't limit yourself just to one type of one type of film. You're like, I'll, I'll take I'll take anything that I can get, you know, and and that's the way to be. Yeah, that's that was my philosophy. Mm-hmm. So I mean, but but like I said, David, it's it's a huge honor to um, to speak with you. I mean, you know, I I never would have dreamed that I would be speaking with you. So well, you I think you, I think you I think you contacted me uh, via email. I think you found my 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 email address and, co- and contacted me. I'm happy to talk to I'm happy to talk to anyone at any time. I'm very easy to find. Uh, uh, I'm on IMDb under David Worth Kickboxer. Um, I can be reached by email at davidworthfilm at gmail dot com. I'm happy to I, I I'm I'm happy to talk to anyone at any time uh, about either my career or. Any any film questions that they might have. Uh, that's what I do now. I write books and I teach. I've got a book. The first book that I had published in 2008 was called The Citizen Kane Crash Course in Cinematography, and it's mm-hmm. available at, at Amazon.com. And uh, it's a fun book that um, that is an introduction to filmmaking for young people. I tried to make it a page turner for young people who might be interested in in uh, in learning about the film business and cinematography. Oh, I, absolutely! And um, unfortunately, we're getting close to out of time, David. And I just wanted to tell my listeners that um, uh, you can also find David on Facebook as well. So. I'm there. I don't I don't check it out very often because I'm not a Facebook fan. I don't want to. I, I think there's a uh, there's a there's a lot of narcissism and and uh, navel gazing there. I, it's kind of a waste of time for me. But I'm there and I, I check in to see my grandchildren and a few other things. But 
I'm not one of these people that, that makes a post every time I, I go buy a pair of shoes or change my picture. Oh, I, absolutely, David. And uh, I, I just want to say real quickly before I let you go, uh, thank you again. And um, next time I have you on the show, maybe we can promote your book or any anything new that you got going on, we can always promote. And uh, I'm sure oh, yeah. me and you will be emailing back and forth, of course. And, and, uh, and I'm happy to check. I'm, I'm, ha- I'm very grateful. Yeah, I'm- so. Yeah, thank you very much, Jess. I'm happy to do it any time. I, you know, I also was the director of photography on two films for Clint Eastwood, Bronco Billy and Any Which Way You Can, and there's a whole story there. So uh, I've done over 35 movies, and each one of them, uh, not a lot of them were, were uh, award-winning films, but they were they were my kids. I loved them. I was passionate about them, and I'm happy to chat with you about them any time. Oh, that that would be great, and 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 like I said, I will be sending, you know, j- just just out of fun, I'll be sending you those uh, that information on those two bloodsport soundtracks Perfect. and just just you know some interesting facts that I've you know found through the years, and, and and like I said, David, I appreciate everything that you've done, and you know, I'm hoping eventually that I'll get the opportunity to, you know sit down with you and meet you face-to-face, that would be awesome. Well, I, hopefully it will happen. Uh, thank you, Justin. I enjoyed chatting with you, and as I said, I'm I'm happy to do it uh, any time. Thank you, David. And um, do you do you have any uh, final thought for my, for my listeners before I uh, let you go? Well, all of the young filmmakers out there, uh, I think that, that what they should be doing is is like what Kurt Corbain did in the 1990s when he was forming garage bands because the technology was there to make records in your garage that would that would go out and reach the public. Now you can do you can form garage film you can be garage filmmakers because the technology is there with DSLRs with nonlinear editing. Uh, you, once you have a, a, a DSLR high def camera and a nonlinear editing system, you're your own studio and you can greenlight your own productions, get your friends together and make a movie. And I highly encourage it. I have lots of stories I can tell about independent filmmaking, but that's another show. Oh, I, absolutely. Because, like I said, David, you are welcome on my show anytime you want, my friend. So. Okay, Justin, all the best. All the best to you, David. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. And ladies and gentlemen, that was David Worth. I had a blast doing this interview. And um, judging by this interview, I will definitely have David Worth back on my show at some point in the year. So stay tuned for that and stay tuned for the next edition of J Ray Radio. Take care everybody and remember, show some respect. <laughs>